What is up, everyone? Welcome back to this episode of Hockey Town University. You're here with me once again, Zach, with my once again lovely co-hosts, Matt and Derek. What's up, boys? What's going on? Someone, anyone oh, speak. Living the dream like always, buddy. There we go. Derek spoke first. All right, continue on. I'm here. <laughs> I guess I can't complain too much, you know. It's been pretty nice in Michigan. We've had the sun out. It's been nice and sunny, nice and warm. I didn't even have to wear a jacket for like the past three days. So, you know, it feels like we're going to be getting some warmer weather. But, of course, that means in Michigan that we're just going to get two feet of snow by the end of the weekend because that's just how it goes. Um, but, yeah, can't complain. I'm living the dream as well. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're all supposed to be getting hit with another snowstorm here on Friday. And then, uh, God, that's, that's, are you guys supposed to get like another eight inches like I am? Because I really don't know what's happening. It's almost 50 degrees out right now. Why am I getting eight inches of snow on Friday? I don't know. Yeah, holy Toledo land does not get uh, snow, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I, I like snow. I know most people don't, but uh, I'd rather have snow than rain. So that's kind of what you we can get. take all of ours, bro. We, we don't want it. I'd be happy with it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, once again, welcome back to this episode of Hockey Town University. Here we are going to take a deep, take a deeper dive into the tenure of Steve Eiserman, what he has done since joining the Red Wings organization as the general manager, and then trying to project an outlook of what the potential four-year uh, outlook is into the future as well. So starting off, uh, the Red Wings are currently playing. They're playing the Chicago Blackhawks right now. Uh, just a couple minutes into the first period, and uh, the Red Wings are, they, oh my goodness, they should have just scored right there. <laughs> I should not be watching this while recording a podcast, so I apologize, That's guys. That's the team, they should have just scored. Yeah. That's tomorrow the team this year. So, they scored a lot of times, but I'm going to ignore that game too right now, because Jesus Christ, I don't, I don't want to know the outcome. I'm going to let it be a surprise. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a win that you would expect for the Red Wings to get, but being uh down a six or actually i believe it's a seven game losing streak now um i could be wrong this could be the seven but I think but it'll be seven after this game if we lose yeah oh, and i'm kind of at the point where does it really matter if we lose no because we won't really fall down the standings too much if we win is that really going to hurt us no because there's not really much growth to move up either so you're probably going to move up one or more two one or two more spots so yeah that's kind of the territory that the red wings are in with their last 19 games of the season so Fantastic, right? Say it with me, folks. Fantastic. Fantastic, Dad. Thank you. So, yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right on into it. So, I figured that I could start off this episode with just kind of talking about where the Red Wings were before Steve Eisenman actually joined. Steve Eisenman was hired as a general manager April 19th of 2019, so that was right after that the season ended. Um, that season in 2019. And then that season, 2018, 19, and 82 games, the Detroit Red Wings scored at 32 wins, 40 losses, 10 overtime losses to garner 74 points overall in the season. And that put them second to last in the division. Uh, they were a minus 50 goal differential. So the kicker is coming up here. Once Steve Eisenman joined the team, it was apparent, and he said this, that I want my guys in the system. This is my team now. And there's going to be some swift changes being made. He did that pretty quickly because the next season in 2019-2020, uh, in 71 games played, they had 17 wins, 49 losses, 5 overtime losses, 39 points. And that was, that was for last in the league. Uh, minus 122 goal differential, and that's definitely one of the worst seasons that a team has ever had in the NHL. So, um, the Red Wings. Let's move on from that one because I, I don't want to relive that. That's PTSD. Um, uh, let's not dwell on that. Yeah. <laughs> so, new year, new us. So, we can all sit here and say that that was probably the worst year that Iserman has had, and that was his first season, right? So, good things came from that because we were then able to draft. Dylan Larkin, or Dylan Larkin. Wow, that boy's on my mind. Okay. Lucas Raymond, okay. Jesus. Okay, yeah, no, we drafted Lucas Raymond at fourth, even though we were the last team uh, in the whole entire league. You know, we were bumped back, and that's something we'll talk about later in this episode. Thanks, um, Batman. Yeah, thanks, Batman. 
Uh, moving on, I did skip over one year because I, I, to be honest with you guys, I really don't know why. But moving on to the 21-22 season in 82 games, they were able to bounce back to 32 wins, 40 losses, 10 overtime losses for 74 points again. But this time they were third to last in the division, but they were a minus 82 goal differential. So not only did it only take the Red Wings three years to get back to where they were before Iserman. Iserman is now doing it with players that he feels are going to push this team and elevate them while also taking out players to further progress the rebuild. So to me, I think that's pretty impressive. So then you jump out over into this season, you're looking at for 2023, 63 games played, 28 wins, 26 losses, 9 overtime losses, 65 points so far, second to last in the division, and they're a minus 20 goal differential. So from Iserman's first year to now currently, the Red Wings have allowed less than 100 goals than they have since season one. That's really, pardon my French, fucking good. Like, I don't care what anyone says. Like, I know in the standings, it really sucks to see them down there, but that's a huge increase in defensive production. And that, and especially in a league where it's so heavily dominated in goals, I was looking um, at stats earlier of how goals have projected over the last 20 years in the league, pretty much. And, I mean, these last two seasons are one of the highest that they've ever been, like top 30 of all seasons in the NHL. And that's also including in the era where Gordie Howe played in, uh, and even um, Wayne Gretzky, where scoring was at its highest. So defense is becoming a lot harder. Scoring is becoming a lot more easy. So I want to hear from you guys what you think about what I just said about the standings, where the Red Wings have been, um, and where they've had to come to now in terms of that from Steve Eisenman doing his job and adding things and removing things. So just tell me what you guys think overall about the standings. I think just in general, when most people look at what a measure, what a good measure is to see how much more successful a team is, they like to look at the standings. And I think in this case, it's, it's really, that doesn't tell the whole story and that's really not the correct mm-hmm. thing to do. Because right. you look at this division that they're in, the Atlantic division, which is, one of, if not the most competitive divisions in hockey right now. I mean, there's legitimately, like, there's, like, five playoff contending teams in here and, like, three Stanley Cup contending teams in this division alone. So, I think just based on the fact that they're still seventh, you look at that and you may think that's a little disappointing at first glance and you're really not necessarily wrong, but that's really just because there's so many teams around them that got better. You know, like Buffalo, Ottawa, they got better. The, the three teams at the top of the division, they've stayed, you know, as, as consistently good as they've been, except for Boston, who is just on an absolute heater right now. I mean, they're, they're looking poised to break records left and right, but that's beside the point. I think when you look at, like, the underlying numbers, like you said, Zach, with the goal differential being minus 20, I think that is a tremendous success. And that not only comes from just getting more talented players, whether it be through agency or the guys you have here have taken a step forward it's really more of just like the switch to the coaching style that the loan has because his coaching style is very much limit the risk in your game and when you do that you're going to have much less turnovers that lead to goals you're going to have much less defensive laps in games and your your defense is going to tighten up a lot better and now the scoring is still an issue we definitely can acknowledge that the scoring is still an issue. That is the number one issue pressing this team right now that they need to solve in the off season and really for next season too. But I think they've made some pretty good progress. Just, you know, where they are in the standings in this division, I really can only point to one team that's objectively worse than them. And that's Montreal. So I think just based on the fact that they're playing all these teams around them, it honestly kind of makes them better in a sense. It's just, you know, like a little trial by fire. You know, they're, they're kind of just like, I guess you could call it like drinking from the fire hose. Like they're just being forced to get better to compete in this division. So I, I think they're not really where they 
should be or want to be right now. But if they keep focusing on things that they've focused on this year, I think that they could get much better in this coming stretch. Thoughts, Derek? Give me that question one more time, because Leslie has a lot of great points, but I got off topic for a second, and I thought we were talking about something different. <laughs> no, you're good, buddy. Yeah, just in terms of, like, the standings from ever since 2018-19 to now, you know, like, what have you noticed that really just stands out to you? And, you know, like, what are some differences from those years to now that, that stand out to you? Thank you for reminding me. So, yeah, the big differences I've seen, like, especially since we've touched base in later episodes about how Yeiserman's been doing it with, like, how when he started to what he's doing now with, with the team, it's only gotten better, 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 and better with every single season. So it's been a great outlook for the entire team. What's been going on the last few years, we def Leslie's right, we definitely have some areas that we've had to work on, like, especially in the goal-scoring area. But uh, what we also have noticed is, we have a lot of like lacking in the defense. I'm pretty sure our goals per average per game were higher in the goals scored on us, obviously, than the goals we are scoring, and that's still pretty low. Like the one thing we have to work on a lot is getting that defense up, and we have a lot of prospects that could actually do that for us. So hopefully, in the future for the Red Wings, the Airsman has picked up a lot of good people, and he knows that they are good, and he knows the talent they have. We've seen, we've done the research on some of these guys. We've seen the points they put up. They've seen the time they put in at different areas in the AHL, OHL, WHL, depending on where they're all playing. It's pretty intense that leagues that they're in, and they're doing all very well right now for most of them. And I believe Yarsman's making like a good picks like early in these kids' careers. He's getting them on board. And from now until the next couple of years in the future, I could see all these guys like end up jumping on the team, leading us into like some victories that we want to see. Yeah, no doubt. And you know, it's <laughs> it's kind of funny that you guys brought it up too, because that's um, something I wanted to jump into was kind of like the list of things that I wanted to go off of like th like what Steve Eiserman has done in terms of like hirings or just like key moments in the franchise that I thought are really um not pinnacles but clear signs that they want to progress in the right way and they want to bring in the right people to do it so not only was Steve Eiserman named the general manager uh April 19th of 2019 uh, they the Red Wings also promote Chris Draper to director of amateur scouting August 16th of 2019. Uh, going down a couple of years later, and I'm sure that there's some things that I miss in between here, so I'm not going off a timeline, but I tried to put these as close together as possible. The Detroit Red Wings then named Dylan Larkin the 37th captain in franchise history January 13th, 2021. Um... And I'll ask you guys this question after I continue going down this list, but I do have a question for you guys about Larkin. Steve Eisenman then hired Nick Lindstrom, uh, former Detroit Red Wing captain. Uh, some would even consider as the best defenseman ever to live. Um, that's me. I would say that, but that depends on who you're talking to. Some would say Bobby Orr. But... It is autograph right here behind me, so I agree. Give me that. It as is, it's fun in hockey, though. But yeah, he was hired as the VP of Hockey uh, January 11th, 2022. The Red Wings then, uh, Sean Horkoff, was named the Grand Rapids Griffins General Manager slash Assistant General Manager to uh, Steve Eiserman February 4th, 2022. Then Derek Lalonde, who was named the head coach June, thir June 30th, 2022. And going back to the standings, and how Leslie pointed out, you know, like the huge dip and the goal differential is huge. And much like I said, the Red Wings have nine overtime losses right now, which means that they lost by one. Since since Dylan Larkin was named captain in 2021, I want to hear from you guys. Thoughts on Larkin being named the captain. I want to hear your initial reaction to it when he was announced as the captain. And then give me your post reaction to now as Larkin being the captain. Do you still have the same thoughts as you did back then? Have they changed? Let's start with Derek. Well, when he was, like, they put him as captain, he was, what, 20 years old, right? Second youngest in our uh, franchise history? Uh, 22? Was he 22? Oh, yeah, because 21 would be, he was about three years. Yeah, so 22, 21, 22. 
whatever. I feel like he's still winning the youngest in the franchise history. Again, the other youngest was, of course, the late great Stevie Eisenman, who's our GM. Like the late but the same. Huh? What? Ignore that concept. Not okay. that. But, you know, the great. There you go. But at the same time, it's like, I've had that. It's like, ever since I saw him play for the first time, I knew he was going to be our captain of the team. They had high expectations for him. They already knew where he was going to be placed before he even got there. It would seem like, like all the dominoes were just falling in place for this that happened instantaneously for him, and everybody knew it. And then I thought it was probably the greatest move they could do. He was a great player coming out of Michigan. He could do pretty much anything that you asked him. He was a great leader over there. He's a great leader with the team. Honestly, I think he's – I mean, I know he's the, for, like, that guy who gets over a point per game, the next with David to pop up on our team. But um, what he's been given, he's done such a great job at actually producing, actually making the team a whole – we obviously saw him crying as Bertuzzi had to leave the team, which obviously was one of his best buddies. The one guy he got the girl with on the team, play all those years. Like, he's a real, like, family member team guy. He's, like, dedicated to the team. He wants everybody to do better. He wants them to do, like, everything as a whole. And up till this point in 2023, he's still doing that same thing. And I feel like he's trying to keep the team together. He's trying to make sure everybody's doing the best they can. He's producing, which is what we want to see. I mean, not as much in these last few games. I hope tonight against Chicago, uh, you know, Patrick, call in and out. Go for it. Zach, don't tell me. I can see you looking at the screen. I don't want to know what the score is even. But we're going to hope for the best tonight. We're just going to kill that losing streak and just, I mean, I know it doesn't matter too much right now, but at the same time, I want to win. But, yeah, I think Larkin has just done a miraculous job through his entire career with us here at the Red Wings, and honestly, I can't argue what he's done. He's He was given a, a shovel, and he got told to go scrape some poo. He did it, and now we're on, down to the concrete. We're good to go. We're going to rebuild from there. Poo free. Leslie, <clears throat> initial post yeah, I mean, I don't reaction. I really know how I follow that up. That was just pure poetry by Derek. But, um, yeah, my initial reaction was um, – I was very happy to see him be named captain, and it was, I think he was named captain the season after literally the worst in history for the Red Wings, which I think there's a good reason for that. It's not only that he was wearing the A, and it was it was really just like the next logical choice that we would have as a captain, but I think a really good measure of leadership is how you respond to adversity, and good lord did this team ever go through adversity in the 1920 season. And... I, I think when you saw all the press conferences and just all like the post game media scrums with Larkin after loss after loss after loss after loss, he wasn't getting down on himself. He wasn't calling out anybody on the team. He wasn't blaming the coach. He just stood there and said, "Yeah, you know what? We're just we're gonna go out. We're gonna get him next time." Like you know, he, basically what I'm saying is he never just like gave up on the team or his game in general. He always believed that they could win the next game. And I think that's really what you need to do as a leader is you need to be the one when all the rest of the team is, you know, kind of down in the dumps and they're not feeling too confident in their game lately. He needs to be the guy that you can rally behind and you can look at him and be like, well, he's still got his head high. He still thinks we can win. Why, why should we think we can't win if he thinks so? So I, I think it's – I think he's a very effective – captain I, I think he really fits the mold very well and of course there's the added cherry on top of this being his hometown team i mean you saw when he re-signed like all the pictures of him and like his uh like when he was probably i don't know seven or eight years old on the ice there wearing the red wing sweater like he's he's always loved this team and it's really nice to see them showing some love again by naming him captain sending him to that long-term deal and when we inevitably get to that cup run he's gonna be leading us on the way. So I, I I think it's great. I think he's a great captain, and I'm excited to see more from him. Both of you made me tear up. I really don't know how to follow up with know, Zach. with both of you. I Listen know. Talk. <clears throat> you guys kind of guys kind of said a lot. So um, I guess for me, you know, like initial reaction when I first heard it, I was like, it's the obvious choice. 
Others would also say that was probably the only choice. But I can't take that away from Larkin because he was the obvious choice and most deservedly so to be the only choice. So reaction now afterwards of him. What? You see a lot of teams go season on season without having a captain. You can't really just like pick some guy in the locker room and just be like, hey buddy, you're going to wear the seat. Hope you're up for the job. It's a long vetting process, and I think you really need to look at the guys on your team and see who really fits that mold of a captain, and then you give him the C on the chest. Like, there's been a lot of teams that just, if there's not the right guy in the locker room, then they're not in the locker room, and you can't do it yet. Yeah, Leslie kind of uh, took the words out of my mouth there when that's kind of the reason why Iserman didn't give him the C right away, right? Like when he came in as a general manager, he kind of wanted to see how Larkin could do with all the pressure, even being the last place team in the league, just seeing how he could uplift a room that was definitely down in the dumps almost every single uh, game that they played. I mean, I, I don't know how much that spilled into the practices or whatnot, but like, yeah, there was a lot of uh, bad nights, and I'm sure it definitely took a lot. And the strong will, willness of people to be able to withstand that. I mean, props to Dylan Larkin. I mean, he's. If you want to say he's still going through it? Sure, he's still technically going through it, but the team is getting better, and he realizes that, or else he probably wouldn't have signed regardless if he is a hometown hero the only issue that i have with people and i don't want to go too much on a rant about this and i don't want to get upset about it but if it's chicago just scored it's really annoying i told you not to tell me it's really annoying when people just keep saying he would be a 2c on a cup contending team i just think that we could have a better a better captain where are we gonna where are we gonna get this kind of person from from free agency they don't show up in free agency anymore that's not how it works there's a cap my, I was telling my dad about that today that the NHL has a cap that they have to work with and he's like how much is it for the Red Wings like 83 mil is that is that what every team has to use with yes and they have 23 uh-huh. players that they have to put on a roster I, like it just blows my mind okay. the people need to understand that it's not as simple as it used to be when the redmonds can go out and just get a shannon hand they could just get a, a haul they could just get whoever the hell they wanted it doesn't work that way and you guys need to get out of your heads that the nhl works that way anymore it does not and you have to start building through the draft when you have 83 mil to work with for 23 people it's tough you can't give every you can't just sign 10 really great players and expect them all to only take 5 million dollars. That's not how life works. Everyone wants to make their draft. Everyone wants it. So, you have to get them through the draft, you have to get them on cheap contracts and then maybe then you can get some other good players through free agency because they're like, "I like what the Red Wings are doing. I don't want to stay here and xyz territory anymore i want to go play with them and i'll take a cut to do it to win a cup that's what we hope for that's how the red wings built their team in the past is because they weren't giving up draft picks they were able to develop those players like henrik zetterberg pavel datsuk nicholas cronwall they didn't have those guys you know start up right away they had them move up in the drafts or in the prospect system that's what the red wings are currently doing okay end rant Thanks for sticking through it with me, guys. I appreciate y'all. We have no choice. It's okay. Yes. So, that leads me into my next question, and I'm not going to go through all of these trades, but I want to talk about key trades that Iserman has had since becoming the general manager. Now, the question that I had written down for the boys, they already knew ahead of time uh, some of these questions I'm about to ask them, but... I want to ask you guys, what are two trades that you have liked or disliked that has been made by general manager Steve Eisman since overtaking the role? Let's start with Leslie. I'll let you pick two. You can pick one that you liked, you can pick one that you didn't like, or you can pick two that you don't like or two that you like, buddy. It's all up for you. Well, I think out of all of them, I think the trade that really is showing to be the most beneficial of the wings is the Nick Letty trade that happened, was that two seasons ago now? 
I think it was 2021 season. The one where they got him or the one where they traded him off? No, the one where they traded him to the Blues. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I would pick that one. Just, I mean, honestly, I could just pick it just based on the fact that they got Jake Bowman out of it. Because this kid is yeah. like a hidden gem, bona fide stud on the blue line. I mean, I, I, I think he's a great fit to this team. And, you know, they're, they're also, there's also those, um, I don't know if you want to call them rumors, but Steve Eiserman has been looking at this kid for a long time, pretty much since he was in Tampa. So, he definitely, this is definitely a guy that, that Eiserman saw an opportunity to go and get, and then he got him. And we're really seeing why. Steve had his eye on him so long because he, he really does everything well. I mean, I, there's not many weaknesses to his game. He is a very effective defender. Um, he's really got, like, a, some good moves on offense. I mean, he's got, like, that little, like, star step move. I think he scored on that, like, three or four times this year. Oh, yeah. I, I think just that piece alone makes that a great trade for us. Not to mention we got a second round pick, which is, I believe it's this year's second round pick. So in a draft that's this deep to get a second round pick on top of what you already have, that's pretty good value for a guy like Nick Letty, who, I mean, he had what five good games here. You, you got that kind of return for him from St. Louis. I mean, that's, that's a fantastic return. Um, another one that I did like, coincidentally also comes from St. Louis. And this was in this previous year's offseason, trading a third round pick for none other than. I believe he was so. This guy is. He's kept us in so many games this year, I can't even really count on my hand how many games he's kept us in. He's. I mean, he's really looking like a bona fide starter in this league, and. I believe we also have him locked up for another two years. So, in a very recent contract, too. So, I, I think to trade a third round for a guy like that, who is a very sturdy, solid option, night in and night out in your net, that's a tremendous value for a third round pick. So, that would be my two that I like. Good choices. Um, Derek, I'm going to go ahead of you. And I'm going to... I'll start it off. All right, I'll be the negative, Nancy. And uh, I'm going to start off with one of the very first trades that Steve Eisenman made as the general manager. And to this day, it still puzzles me. I don't understand why he did it. Um, maybe now, like looking back at it, I guess it didn't really... I don't know how I... Okay. Adam Ernie for uh, the Red Wings 2024th round pick uh, to Tampa Bay Lightning. So we got Adam Ernie from Tampa Bay. Um... Yeah, it's not that I don't like Adam Ernie. It's just that he, when we got him, it was like, I don't know. He he was a body. We needed bodies. We didn't have like good young players that could come play. So we're like, okay, let's just try and get some with some cheap picks. See if maybe we can turn them into something. He Steve Eiserman knew him from the Tampa Bay Lightning system, obviously. So he got to play a couple seasons. Um, first season, fifty six games, five five points. Like, oh my god, yeah. It, it, I mean, collectively in the last four seasons, he's gotten fifty nine points for us, and probably like two hundred something games. So, I mean, for a fourth round pick, I mean, like that's it's decent that a fourth round pick even makes it to the NHL. So, like I said, it's not a diss on Adam Adam Ernie, but. To me, that's just one of the traits that I really don't like. Call me dumb if you want, but and then you ended up giving him a contract for two point one million dollars for two years. Um, I wasn't really a big fan of that. Um, and I'll say that I, I think I'll do another bad one. My other bad one is Mike Green with fifty percent retained for a twenty twenty fourth round pick from Edmonton and Kyle Brodziak. Um, this is one of the moments where I wish Mike Green was traded either the season or two before when he was actually, prime. when he was actually not injured all the time. Um, I'm pretty sure he went out. 
and I could be wrong. I thought it was a back injury, but I could be wrong on that. So please don't quote me on that. But that's another one that I hated because then you also retained 50%. So you took back almost $3 million uh, in cap space for them while also taking Kyle Brodziak. Granted, that was just LTIR, but you're still technically paying that guy. Uh, and you only got a fourth round pick out of it. So you pretty much just got the pick back that you sent off for Adam Ernie. Um, so they got Adam Ernie for free. And they got to use Mike, Mike Green a little bit. And then, yeah. So those are the two trades that I really don't like um, so far in Steve Eisenman's tenure. And thankfully, they're early on. But they're also players that obviously at that time weren't needle movers. So... What can you do? Derek, give us two likes if you can. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't want you don't want me to go into negative right now? You can if you want, but I Honestly, figured you just wanted me to be that person on this podcast today. I mean, I, I was prepared for this one, so I have put a few in here, which, of course, the first one oh, was already taken by... And Leslie over here, I wanted to talk about Wallman, but, you know, it's okay. Like, right there. Okay, at least he didn't touch on that uh, ass that we got that we got to get rid of right away, too, afterwards. Sunquist didn't get as much, but, you know, what? got us that fourth rounder. But uh, let's go with something different than what you guys are talking about. Most of everything typed out here. A little happier thoughts. Lombardi... With a fourth round pick from Vegas, and they get a fifth round pick. That kid is killing it right now. You saw that like, one that too. That was a great trade. Yeah. Ah, uh, all that. Uh, look through all that. I was like, "How did we do this?" It's a beautiful trade. That kid is destroying it right now. I think. I think I already talked to you about this, Zach, a little bit ago. <laughs> or I think it might have been another player, but we'll talk about the player later. Not right now, but. Oh, my. 86 points in 60 games. Killing it. You can't really, like, topple that right now. And that's what he's doing this year. Or he's projected for more. Bring that kid up. That was a great trade for Vegas' pick. And Stevie did a good job on that person he was picking up with that trade. And then, you know, to stay away from the negative side, to jump into a different one, the Fabry trade is pretty good, too. Trade for Della Rose. Hasn't done jack crap for years. Like, I don't even know. Yeah, he might not be playing anymore. I really don't know, but he's, he's not got a anymore. No way. See? Beautiful. Look at that trade by Stevie right there. He knew what he was seeing with Fabry and kids producing. We can't be too upset with that. I mean, of course, we're having a little off year back and forth, but he's putting up points. He's killing it. What a trade. Good job, Stevie. Fun fact, Jacob De La Rose is indeed not playing in the NHL anymore. He plays in the in the Swiss League, uh, 49 games and uh, 23 points. So he's putting up more points in, uh, okay. in the Swiss League than he ever did in the NHL. <laughs> so good for him. He bonds. It's okay. I think what this little exercise has shown us is Steve has a lot more hits than he has misses. We're really reaching for some of these negative trades. I'm not going to lie, my negative one was just me being butt hurt by the Petruzzi, Petruzzi trade. I, I actually yeah, that's just me. I do, have an, I do have a negative one that I do want to put across. So, honestly, this could go either way because, you know, his time in Detroit was, was very tumultuous, I guess so you could say. But the seventh round pick for Jacob Verana, that has all of the ability world to blow up in our face. I mean, if Jacob Rana clears out whatever demons he has in his head in St. Louis, really turns out to be a better fit, which it probably will be because they'll give him every opportunity. And he scores 30 goals again in a season, we're going to look like complete donkeys trading him for basically future considerations. I mean, a seventh round pick is nothing. So that one, I, I get why it was done, and I get that you really couldn't give that much more value for him. But this trade absolutely could blow up in our face and be the worst one that Steve has made. Yeah, I mean, it I definitely... completely agree with you on that one, Leslie. Yeah, it definitely does have that potential. I mean, it just came down to, you know, it definitely sounded like, you know, 
things weren't on the good end, unfortunately. So it did seem like that it was either going to end in a buyout or a trade. So once the trade became available, it was like, all right, we'll still retain 50% for a seventh. Like, it's just like you said, you know, it just, it worked out for both parties. You know, he, he wanted to do Verona the favor of putting him in a spot where St. Louis obviously will use him because they just shipped off two really good players in Tarasenko and O'Reilly. So you're right, though. It will suck when we see him put up 30 goals if he does go back to form like he was. But, you know, all the best of luck to him. Hopefully he doesn't score those 30 goals on us. That's all I can oh, yeah, I, I definitely wish him luck. And I, I think when you talk about a buyout as being the other avenue of that, you, you would definitely rather trade the guy and retain some salary than do a buyout. Like, yeah. you never really want to do a buyout. So I guess in that sense, the trade makes a little more sense. But I don't know. It's just the whole fact that, like, absolutely could go back to form and this is not me saying i hope he doesn't i hope he's very successful in everything he does in the rest of his life but it could look like a bad one in a couple years if he's he's just lighting it up in st louis well to take away from it i think that if there's anything that we've learned is that eiserman definitely doesn't take shit so i'm mm-hmm. um, not saying that that's what verano was giving him but he definitely doesn't He's got a he's got a fine line of don't don't cross this where we might actually have some problems where I'm not going to be mad at you but this is going to be something that I really don't want to be a part of my team and probably saw it as a distraction whatever it is but enough of that sorry folks <laughs> you got to go into that continuing on so I know that we talked about previous teams. The other question that I wanted to ask you guys, if there was one player from the 2019-20 team, so the first season that Steve Eisenman was the general manager, if you could pick any player from their prime to start on the Red Wings next season, who would you take and why would you choose them? And I think I wanted to start because I think I know who Derek wants to take and you can't take the same person as I do. I'm so sorry. But I think I'm I think going, we're to, going to take the same person. I, yeah, I think we all would take the same person. Um, and I'm so going to I'm going to take Mike Green. I think if you had him with Mo Sider as your tandem on the right side, Mike Green was such an offensive powerhouse for the Washington Capitals for so long that it it, it would just be dumb of me not to take him. And he was so good on defense too. And it just sucks that we got him on the back end of his good years and majority of or actually all of his bad years as well so that would be the one person that i would install in the red wings 23 24 lineup and sign him to a six to eight year deal if he was in his prime today so uh leslie let's hear from you buddy you know it's actually really funny that you went with mike green because i really thought that you were going to say jonathan bernier R- really he would be such yeah well i mean if we're doing this based on like you know not how they are now but how they were in 1920, because obviously Bernier is not, I don't think he's even playing in the NHL anymore, but yeah, I mean, that solves your backup goaltender right there, doesn't it? Which we've had issues with all season long. He'd be a very solid backup. You know, it's funny, I was uh, just, like, last week, I was scrolling through all of my liked videos on YouTube, I went, like, all the way down. One of my first liked videos is, like, the top 10 plays for the 1920 season for the Red Wings. Jonathan Bernier was, like, eight of them. It was just him, like, standing on his head because he was playing in front of a literal, like, beer league defensive goal. Like, yeah. <laughs> he got no hope whatsoever. So, yeah, if we could get Jonathan Bernier back, like, that'd be, you know, the way he was playing in 1920, that'd be a solid 1A, 1B right there, or at least he'd just be a solid backup, which we haven't had all season long. Derek, it's your turn, but... Before you do, I just want to say that there is one other person on this list that I I don't think that you would take, but it would go against Leslie, and I kind of hope you take this person. So uh, who do I want from 20? Nice. There's one player I can think of that I just don't even want on the team anymore, or ever to be on it. It starts with the A and set ends with the applicator. Anytime I see that name, man, I just get her for gossip blades. Ah, oh, hello, big player. Well, let's open this early wound. I want Horonic back. <laughs> We're going to pick a player from 2019. 
19. I'm going to throw his ass right back in there. I want my defenseman back. The only good righty we had, we sent him off. I, got, I know it was a good trade, but we better have something up the sleeve for that side, man. Because I, even though Stevie's talked about it, we can throw a lefty on the righty, but at the same time, I, I just want my righty back. It's 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 funny how you picked him and his 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 pinnacle or his prime, I guess you would say, would probably be the season that he was traded. So this season, so you. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. I'm like, we're going to have a good season. Get rid of him. It's like, why do you got to do that to my soul? All right. Like, well, we barely had him. I wanted some better news from that. Uh, whatever. All right, all right. Let's yes. move on to the next topic. We all had some great choices there in Mike Green, Jonathan Bernier, and Philip Peronic. Derek, yeah, too soon, too soon, buddy. The next topic that I really want... <laughs> The next topic that I really wanted to go over was the notable players drafted by Eisenman, and there's 21 of them. At least from what I accounted for, me, myself, at least being a little more familiar with the prospects in the system. I know that Leslie is. Um, Derek does need a little help in that regard, so he had a little homework today. Um, so I'm just going to break it down on you know the first, second, third, fourth. There wasn't really anything in the fifth round that I saw. Um that could be utilized in the future. No offense to those that are drafted in the fifth round. I know you guys are out there. You guys are ready to be NHL players, but fortunately you haven't been drafted by the Red Wings, in my opinion. So, first round, uh, you got Mo Sider, Lucas Raymond, Simon Ed Edvinson, Kosa, Sebastian Kosa, who was in our latest episode, if you guys haven't catch, catch that. You know, he just keeps on swimming in the Toledo walleye, so go ahead and check that out. Break it down for you. And then Marco Casper, the latest draft pick. Um, and then Edvinson and Kosa uh, were taken in the same draft. So, or do I have that right? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. First and first. Yep. So, you know, that was the first year, you know, that we had multiple first round picks. So that was great to see. Hence why we have five out of the four years that Eisman has been able to draft. Um, then you go into the second round. And I feel like that that's honestly um, outside of the first um, he's hitting some pretty good names. You got Tuo Misto. That's someone that we're still kind of seeing what's going on with him. You know, he kind of has been jumping around where he went from the NCAA. He then went over into, I believe it was the Finnish league, and I could be wrong there. Someone could uh, quote me on that. But uh, then you got Robert Mastro Simone, um, Johansson, Wallander, Niederbach, all the Swedes right there. You got Cross Hannes, Shai Buyam, Dylan James, who's a recent draft pick, um, who's been doing pretty decent. And then um, Buchnelnikov, who's over uh, playing in the VHL, MHL, KHL over in Russia. He's looked pretty good. You go into the third round, you got Donovan Sobrango, someone who was instilled with the Grand Rapids Griffins early on as a young player during the COVID year where he wasn't going to see any playing action and he was uh yeah put into the Griffins really early and honestly that's someone who could be a bottom pairing defenseman for us uh in the future how soon I really don't know like I said he's still young so we just gotta give these uh later draft picks some more time then you got Emil Vero another defensive prospect and you got Leslie's favorite prospect Carter Mazur who's been killing in the NCAA as well. Love going me, going into the fourth round, you got Red Savage. Love the name. A lot of people were hyped about selecting that player just based on his name alone. I don't know if it's because it's that <laughs> 70 show name. name or what. Yeah, see? <laughs> it put a smile on Derek's face. He'll play some NHL you know, games. He'll, that name he'll, play, he'll play some NHL games. He'll probably be a bottom six role. Uh, type of player, but that's okay. We need players like those. Then you got Amadeus Lombardi, like hey, Derek touched hey, on earlier. We need a savage down there is what we need. We need a savage down there. So yeah, Amadeus Lombardi, like Derek said, ammo. Um, then you got Maximilian Kilpinen. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. That's another Swede. Then you got everyone's towering behemoth, the sixth rounder, Elmer Soderblom. So those dudes still exist, those rare unicorns, and he is a unicorn because of how big he is and how silky his hands are. You know, that's going to be our next 
Pavel Datsuk, Henrik Zetterberg type of player where you draft in the later round, you know, it doesn't really happen as much anymore. Um, obviously, there were a lot more picks that you could choose from back then as well. But granted, you know, the league is harder to get into. It's a lot more harder to develop the players into what you expect them to be come to draft day. You really have to take account into your scouting. So, and that comes in with Chris Draper. That's the reason why they hired him. He's someone who knows how to look out for those types of players because him himself being an early draft pick, you know, he was traded for basically a dollar. So he knows what it takes to be someone who is at the top to the bottom to make it back to the top. So good looks on that. And they've been doing a really good job and outlooking, you know, the 2023, 24 draft with the Red Wings. It just, it doesn't end there. I almost just spilled my coffee. You know, the Red Wings have two first round picks uh, twenty in 2023. They have three second round picks in 2023, two first round picks in 2024. And then they have one second round pick in 2024. You know, that's eight picks total in the t in the first two rounds for the Detroit Red Wings. That's a lot of ammo that they have that they can utilize towards either prospects, high-end prospects, or even high-end talent. Now that we just traded away Philip Peronik, the one the player that Derek wants to bring back, that's something that we could use towards trading for a young right-handed defenseman if we wanted to, or draft for one. So... You know, that's, I, I just want to hear from you guys what you guys think about these players, you know, like, tell, tell me what you guys are most excited for out of these list of players that I just named off. Give me one player that you guys really want to see make the team in the future. And I guess one player that you don't know a lot about, but you would like to learn a little bit more. That might be a little hard to answer, but. Let's just stick with the first question first, and then you can right. dabble into the second one if you want. So, I mean, I got an answer for both of them for you already. Let's go with Derek, then. Derek, right. you can start off, buddy. Go right ahead. Oh, well, let's go with the first question, who I want to see with the wings right now is, obviously, Kosa. Like, the kid's been killing it down in my hometown team of uh, walleyes over there. He used to watch them all the time. The fact that he's down there killing it right now, what is he doing, like, Nine and one for the last ten games or something like that. Just doing amazing and a great career start up for him. Yeah, uh, let me check real quick. I have him right here. Yeah, Kosa. It, like I oh, talked about in the previous short clip for you guys, you know, he was voted for Player of the Week for the ECHL, who's now sporting in those seven games they started since February eighth. Um, currently, right now, he's played in thirty five games. 2.5 goals against average and a 9.11 save percentage. Beautiful. Honestly, that's really great for someone who's only, uh, he, yeah, 20 years old, November 21st, 20, what, 2002. 20? Yep. He's 20. Yeah. Yep. And guess what? He's six freaking six, 210 pounds. He's a giant. That's a like big a boy. Yeah. Like, that is someone I want to see in front of our net. Hosa has been doing great. Not good to anything he's done doing great right now love to see them both in tandem though back and forth it's going to do better i want to see a competition between the both of them right now pretty much but to go back to the other person someone that we don't know too much about let me pull this little cutie pie up let me tell you right now i cannot say or pronounce this young man's name for the life of me That's what he is very about. russian That's what you want to learn Exactly. Another thing, from what I'm going to say, I'm going to call his name, but I believe his first name is Kirill. Kirill Tutinteyebe. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh. Yeah. There's a lot of Ys in his name. Kirill yeah, Tutuyev. The looks of it, he's, yeah. We thought he was going to be the enough Doxook. I mean, from what he's been doing, like, just in his last games alone, killing it, he's projected to, like, well over half a point per game. Right now, he's just a tremendous playmaker, it looks like, in all honesty. I believe he 31 games. I feel like he's going to have a little spark in there. I know he's a little older. He's at 22 now, not in the league yet. But I feel like with what he's doing, especially on the walleye, Kosa and him, bring them up a nice little tip there. I don't see anything going wrong with that. But at the same time, don't know enough about him. I want to know a little bit more because this looks like the first year he's actually blown up. 
So, Besides back in 2019. So the, that's a lie. Yeah. So the 2018, 114 points. Sorry. So so yeah. So he was he was regarded as a pretty good prospect. I mean, granted, he was taken in round seven in 2019, but. Yeah, Derek, in 21-22 season with the Griffins, he got to play nine games. He had three points, and he ended up getting injured. And I'm pretty sure the same thing happened, and I could be wrong. But, yeah, something obviously wasn't clicking in the AHL, so they sent him down to Toledo. Um, and he's done nothing but thrive. So, yeah, there's a good opportunity for him to make the team next season. And this is, like Leslie said, this is someone that a lot of Wings fans were excited about. And, could see a decent amount of Pavel Datsuk in him. And I think part of that is also because he's from the same town that he, that Pavel Datsuk was from. Um, I was about to say that say, Russian in him is uh, what's pulling you in there a little bit. Just, just their, just their history and the way that they came about like developing, like the, just the prospecting system and the route that they went to get here is just the similarities and traits that they saw of Pavel Datsuk. So you picked a pretty good one, and that's one of the players I didn't name off. So props to you for trying to say a name with a lot of Ys, even though you didn't actually try. But say it with me. Tatuia. Hey, Jersey one day with just yay on it. That's all. <laughs> I don't even know the full name. It's going to be yay. Um, Put it on the back of Jersey. Leslie, I'll go next. Um, One player that I really want to see up there. I I could t- take the cop out and just say Soderblom because he has already played a couple times, but I won't. Um. I think I really want to see Johansson get a couple games this season. Um, and I just heard this today, and I didn't realize this. And I wish, oh, you know what? I heard it from the Grindline uh, podcast today. Uh, they had Daniela Bruce on their episode. Um, they talked about how Johansson has actually been playing a decent amount of games for the Griffins on the right-handed side. So... That's someone that I would like to see get a couple games on the bottom pairing, um, even if it is just nine games before he burns that one year of ELC contract. Um, well, actually, no, they also mentioned on there that, that that doesn't even matter considering because he's a little bit older. So it would burn a year off anyways regardless. So, yeah, I think that that's a player that I probably would bring up um, just to see what you're getting out of him. If not, then maybe that's someone that you package off in a trade. But that's who I'm selecting. Um, a player that I really want to know a little bit more um, would probably be Dylan James. Um, he was a recent draft pick, um, taken in the second round. That's someone who obviously isn't being talked about, and I don't know if that's because he's just not really doing too well. But for me, I think that that's the player that I want to see more out of. Um, playing out of the University of North Dakota, he's got 14 points in 32 games. So as a freshman, you know, that's pretty expected out of someone being 19 years old. He's got a late birthday, so uh, going into next year, he'll start uh, midway through the season at age 20. But, you know, his draft year, he put up 61 points in 62 games in the USHL. So um, I don't know how I'm going to be able to watch some games of him. But, uh, yeah, this is a player that I definitely like to learn a little bit about more considering that we utilize a second-round pick for him, and that was the 40th pick overall. So, uh, yeah, Leslie, one player that you want to see with the Red Wings and then one player that you wish that you could uh, know a little bit more about? Well, you already know what my answer is going to be. For I don't know. I think the guy I'd rather I'd like to see on this team, I think he's the most NHL-ready right now. I genuinely would not be shocked if there was a chance he could play on this team after a season ends. Marco Casper. I want to see him play on this team. I, you know, I said it on the last episode with my hot take, he will be a Calder finalist. He is the guy, I know you probably thought I was going to say Carter Mazur, but I think out of our entire prospect pool, really even above Simon Edmondson, who objectively might be the most NHL ready, I guess, I want to see Misa Marco Casper. I want to see this dude in the NHL. I think when you watch him play in Rogla over in the SHL, you can kind of see in his game that he has... Almost a little bit of like a Tyler Bertuzzi in this game. He's a very gritty player. I mean, he's, he's the kind of guy that will score a goal, go punch you in the face. And it's not even just goal scoring. He's a very shifty playmaker, too. He's like a little water bug out there offensively. He zip, he's like zipping and zagging through everything. So uh, I would absolutely love to see him, if it's at all possible, for the remainder of this year. Well, not the remainder of this year, but get some games 
in the season while it's still here. Uh, I think a guy I would like to learn a little more about. God, there's there's a lot of them. Um, I'm gonna go with another one of our goaltending prospects that I don't think a lot of people know that much about. Uh, Carter Guylander, mm. who's over in I believe it's Colgate mm-hmm. in the NCAA. Yeah. Uh, from what I've heard, he's doing very well on that team. Um, I don't have his stats pulled up right here in front of me, but I know that he's had a pretty solid year this year, mm-hmm. and he's been getting you know some accolades, some kind of shine over there. So I would really like to learn a little more about him. I don't really know what the level of competition he's playing there in the NCAA. Um, I would imagine he's playing teams like BU over in the East and Northeastern who are really good college hockey programs, and they have they have a few NHLers on that on those teams. So if he's playing against guys like that and that's helping his development, then I think that's a really good thing for him. I honestly think he's a dark horse to go and join. Actually, let me. No, never mind. I'm not going to say that. I think when Kosa, if everything goes well for the rest of this year, goes up to Grand Rapids and takes a job there, I think you see Guy Lander in the ECHL to replace him because I believe their other goaltending, the other goaltender there is supposed to go up to the AHL too. Or he could just stay there and be the starter. Maybe Guy Lander would be the backup. I don't really know. But I would definitely like to learn a little more about him. Watch a little bit more of his game. And see how he stacks up against Kosa. Because it's never a bad thing to have two solid goaltending prospects in your system. That's a good thing for just insurance purposes. That's a good thing for trade purposes. Maybe he's a prospect that some teams are looking at. That you could use for future trade. I don't know what that would look like. But yeah, I'd like to see a little more of him. That's a good choice. I mean, this is definitely an interesting prospect. And for a comparison, you know, I'm drawing a blank on the goaltender prospect that we had. I can't remember if it was last season or two seasons ago. And I want to say it was two seasons ago because it was the year that we actually ended up drafting COSA. So it was two years ago. This is kind of like the similar situation where the player went and played all four years in the NCAA and then ended up saying, you know, I don't want to be with the Red Wings organization. So yeah, I think you're talking about the guy who was on. I think it was Denver. I can't remember his name though. He ended. He ended up saying, I think it was. He ended up going with Toronto, and I don't know Mm -hmm. if he's still there or not. But Uh, um, I know you're talking about. But anyways, you know that you know you're right, Leslie. Like it's he's he's a player who keeps on doing a little bit better as the seasons go on. You know he's played in 34 games this year. He's got a two, uh, point three nine goals against. He's got a point nine one five save percentage. Um. That stacks up to 15 wins, 14 losses, and 5 overtime losses. I mean, that can attribute to, obviously, poor offensive numbers from his team. I mean, Colgate University. Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't know much about how his team is doing, but I, right. I have heard that he's a pretty good goaltender in that division. So, I mean, from his stats alone, you have to go with that he has improved the entire time he's been at that place, too. As I'm looking at the same stuff you guys are looking at, so you yeah, can definitely he, tell he sure he's has. improving. Now, yep. the... The, the the only thing is that I have with this prospect is that is he someone who is actually serious about continuing to become an eventual NHL player? Does he is he someone who actually wants to keep playing hockey? Because if he goes in the Colgate next season, then okay, is this just going to be the same route as the last guy who was in the system, but really not in the system? You know, so he's not on a contract or anything. So if he if he doesn't sign a contract at the end of this season. I'm not very hopeful that he will stick around in the system, but nonetheless, this is definitely someone they should probably watch out for. And just, you know, like you said, you know, it's good to have that competition for Kosa and it is good to have that reassurance that you're going to have a good tandem in the future, whether if that's five or 10 years from now, because you're definitely going to have Kosa in that spot, whether if he is the uh, first one or the second tender. Um, just for game updates, I know that you guys have already watched the game once you guys are watching this, but the Red Wings are down two to one now. Jake Wallman scored and Robbie Fabry is out and will not go. return with a lower body injury. So sorry, That's Derek. That's the Hockey University bump right there. I just talked about him. Now we got a goal. Yep, but it came with a Robbie Fabry injury, so way to go, Leslie. Mm-hmm. Well, I did not talk about Robbie Fabry, so that's not that one is not on me. Uh, yeah, it's on me. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, blame. I was hoping not to know this until we're gonna done with this podcast. 
because I my screen's just blank right now. I can't get TNT or whatever the heck it's screaming on because I pay for Bali. Bali? Bali? I call it Bali. I know it's Bali, but Everybody I call it Everybody give Derek King in the comments. Kill me for it. So. But apparently it's not on tonight. Okay, I'm done. Go Zach. <laughs> Let the moderator speak. All right. No, I'm just kidding, guys. All right. So um, I wanted to have a little fun um, before I answer or ask this question, moving on to the next topic. And we're almost done here, folks. Uh, thank you for sticking this long uh, in the video. I know that this is a pretty deep, deep dive into Iserman's tenure and what he has done. But we just kind of want to let you enlighten you guys and let you know that he's just not doing this for fun, right? Like, I know that some of you guys are pretty upset that the team – hasn't been doing well in the standings or at least making the playoffs, but we are making strides at least in the category of getting good players for this team. So I did the liberty of making my own 2025 projected lineup based on the prospects of who we just named off. Um, this is going to be without free agents. Um, what I am using are players that are currently um, signed until the 2025 season for the Red Wings. And then I am inserting whatever prospects that I saw fit. Um, Leslie, Derek, I didn't ask you guys to do this exercise. Um, but once I say my lines and everything, you guys can intervene. Um, tell me if you guys have any objections to who I put where or you know what else you guys would do. But it was easier for me not to add in free agents or future prospects because I would add Connor Bedard if I would, but I don't know if we're going to get him. So that would be a little unfair. We no, we will. If we, I like the same process, will, though. If we say we will, it'll happen. We just need to manifest it. Wake up every morning when you wake up, and before you go to bed, say we're going to get him, and then we'll get him. All hail Magic Conch, I it was Derek. With us. Yeah, Derek should say it, because he's the Magic Conch. <laughs> All hail Magic Conch. We're getting Bernard, guys. Good job. We did it. Stop the count, Gary Bettman. We already got him. So, so do the lottery. without further ado, this here... Over contract. <laughs> without further ado, here is Zach's 2025 projected lineup uh, going into the 2025-2026 season. So, starting from left to right, on the top line, I have Michael Rasmussen, left wing. Dylan Larkin, top center. Lucas Raymond, top right wing. Then you get down to the second line. This is when it starts to get a little interesting. You have Joey Valeno as the 2C. You have Andrew Kopp as the left wing. And you have Yanni Burgers as your right wing. I know that he doesn't shoot right, but I'll get to that I point. Like so I'll, get, I'll get to the point later on. Left to right again. Elmer Soderblom on the third line. Marco Casper centering that line. And then Derek's player that he was trying to talk about earlier, Dosette, if that's how you pronounce it, the guy with over 100 oh, points or at least projected to have it. So I do have him on here. I do think that he does make the Red Wings lineup eventually. I, I am a firm believer in that. And just based on the prospects that we have, you know, it just made the most sense. And um, going into my fourth line, I have Carter Mazur, Amadeus Lombardi, Ammo. And then cross Hannes on the right wing. Um, if you guys are wondering why I have a bunch of left wings on the right wing, is because well we don't have very many right-handed shooters, so that's pretty much the reason why. But yeah, I mean like without adding free agents, I mean you're adding some really young prospects. I know looking at them now, you're like, who the hell are some of these guys? But it, this is what you're going. This is what the Red Wings and Steve Eisman have been trying to do is add these players. And I know right now some of these names aren't popping up in your head. But like I was telling my dad earlier on the phone today, you'll re you'll know these names. I know you don't know very many Red Wings players right now, but you will know some of these names that Iserman has been drafting, and that's how you build in the NHL today. That's what they did in Tampa Bay. That's what they did in Colorado. That's what they did in St. Louis and all these other teams, Washington Capitals. They didn't go out and trade for top free agents. They didn't go out and trade for top talent. They went out and drafted them. That's what the Red Wings are trying to do. Moving on to the defense, you got Jake Wallman on the left side, Moet Sider on the right side. You then got Simon Edvinson on the left, and then you got Johansson on the right. William Wallon, Wallander on the left, Ben Sherrod on the right. Yes, he will still be on the team, yeah, unfortunately. Thank you. Now, I made an exception on this one only because 
I didn't want to leave any spots blank. And it was tough for me to choose goaltenders, so I signed Huso to a three-year extension. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more, who knows, because I do see that happening. And then I have Kosa as the backup. And that and I know Derek sees this guy as someone who could be up quicker. Um I do think by 2025 that will be too soon still, but like I said, I think that that wouldn't be a bad option as your backup if he keeps continuing to trend in the right direction. And based on how everything's working out in the Grand Rapids system, he'll be fine in Grand Rapids once he does start with them next season. And I'm a firm believer that he will be starting with them next season. I think after this season in Toledo, he has nothing left to show there. And the next step forward for him in his development is to go into a harder league and start learning from that to be an NHL player. So what are you guys thoughts on that? How does 2025 Red Wings look? (laughs) Honestly, I love how that looks. You put my boy, the one I didn't say earlier, Dukan on the third. What's that? Oh, Dosette. Dukan. Yeah. Dose, oh my god, what a butcher there. Dose, yeah. <laughs> I'm a third line. No, I do not. I was arguing with Sarah earlier about that, because I was like looking at all these names from the WHL. I was like, sorry. Oh, sorry, QHL. Go back, I can't do you. I'm sorry, you guys got me with French. But, oh, honestly, yeah. Honestly, that's like a great lineup. That would be probably his first year up there. So that'd be a great spot for him. Third line right there. And he'll probably progress through the year as long as he keeps up what he's doing. And I like the lineup for the forwards. Other than that, that's nice. Especially for the defense. But when you said Sherrod at the very bottom, you tickled my fancy so quickly. Thank you. Yeah, and it I was... I know it's like... I, sorry, and I just wanted to say, originally I actually you know, did have Sherrod in the top four. And then I thought about it and I was like, I'm looking at Johansson's age right now. And then thinking about it in two years, you know, he's going to be two years older, a little bit better. And I think, you know, if you inserted him in the lineup next year as the bottom right-handed D and he progresses doing that, then that's when you can say, okay, let's bump him up over Sherrod. Because at this point where, where else are you going to fit Sherrod on the lineup? And if you're not, you know, buying him out or trading him by that time, then, yeah, that's where you have to put him at that point if he just keeps on blowing his assignments and tackling player over there when he should be right here. <laughs> so. I mean, you're right about it. And the fact is, I mean, beyond that, going to the goalies that we got, like, oh. as much as I do really want to see uh, <clears throat> Osa up there in the league starting off right away, I know he has – He's in the EHL right now. He's playing for a lower tier. Nothing like what the Griffins are. He's going to be a lot more aggressive when he gets up back into that area. He has to prove himself there first, too. I don't want to push him into something he's not ready for. But at the same time, I would love just to see him get a little more experience up in the NHL. I know that's exactly what you're saying, Zach. Put him. He'll get a lot more playing time up there. I just really hope he's doing exactly what he does next year in the NHL that he does the ne- previous, or not the previous, the next year in the NHL. So hopefully you're right on that one. But I can't poop on your uh, lineup too much. It's pretty. It's a, that's a playoff contender for sure. I tried my best. I mean, at that point, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, it was tough, especially without knowing like what you're going to do in free agency. I mean, Eisenman has all those draft picks still like that's without using the 23, 24 draft prospects as well. You know, Eisenman can use those as leverage. So I, Leslie, what, did you have any thing to say on that lineup that I spoke out to you? I know that you could probably look at it on paper right now, but um, what do you think about it? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I do really like the lineup and I, I think just, Based on what we have in our system, you're really not too far off with this lineup. The only things that I would really change is I think I'd put Casper up to the 2C spot. Because I think Valeno, we've seen him be like a, a bottom six centerman. I think that is, I think that's his ceiling. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think he's a very effective third line center and fourth line center if he has to be bumped down with depth. I think he really excels in that role. And I, I just think that Casper... He's going to hit his ceiling as a second-line center. I just I have all the faith in the world for him. The, a second line of Cop, Casper, and Bergeron, 
I mean, I'm salivating at the prospect of that happening. That sounds incredible to me. I was... I mean, you've got... Sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, sorry. No, and that was another one that I was kind of tossing in between because I was like, do I want Casper with some younger players? But I figured, you know, him being a little bit smaller, he could play with a big body like Soderblom and then, like, a good scoring player like Dosette. But then, you know, kind of like you said, you know, you're putting a young player like Casper with a veteran like Cop, and then Berggren, who's been in his third season by that time. So that could also work out. So I don't think that there's any bad option you can go, and you can definitely be interchangeable. Like maybe Kirill Tatuyev, maybe next season he lights it up in Grand Rapids, and then all of a sudden he finds himself in a bottom uh, role for the Red Wings or something. You never know. Like this isn't set in stone. This is just what I see based on what I know on the prospects. And, you know, it was really tough not doing it based on, what we're going to get in this upcoming draft and then in 24 and then just the free agents as well. So just based on prospects alone, this is what the team would look like in 2025. If you did not sign any other players um, than what we already have signed right now. So it's, is it better than what we currently have? Maybe you might, I think you might be a little bit, I think you're going to be better defensively and maybe your scoring production might be a little bit better and you might be a fringe playoff team, but you definitely will have to add some free agents in there. If you can, or just, just trades for um, more skilled players, I guess that's probably not the way that I want to say it, but this won't be the final outcome of it. Some of these players are probably going to get traded, you know, and it's just the reality of it that, um, don't have a favorite player, <laughs> unfortunately, unless you're okay with watching him go to another NHL team. But, yeah, that's just the harsh reality of it. If you really love hockey, you'll be okay with it. But if you love the Red Wings, don't get attached to anybody who's brand new. Anybody who only has a two- or three-year deal, don't get con- attached to them because it's a big possibility that you're going to get traded for something better. Equally better, though. Got to remember that. Because Stevie isn't going to give up somebody who's good for less that he can get back in return. Okay, well, I, I want them to keep going a little bit in the lineup because there, there is one other thing that I would change. But I, I do want to point out that I like how you have Dill set on here. I, I think he'll have a, a pretty good role with the team. You know, with what he's doing right now in the queue, he's doing that as an overager. So he's already further along in his development than some of our other younger prospects are. So I, I do like that he's going to be down in the depth as so like a little bit of a depth winger. Um. The only other thing I would change is I'd like to see Edmondson playing with Cider. I think Lawman would be a really good partner for Johansson if he's going to play on the right side. And obviously, I mean, you you got to work with what we have because it's made out of the prospects. But I think our def- our defense is going to look much much different after this draft, this coming draft. So that's the only thing I would really change is Edmondson with Cider. I mean, that's what is Edmondson like six seven and the Cider is six five. That'd be one of the bigger defensive pairs up in the league so anytime you're on the ice with those two you know, you're going to shit your pants basically and I, I do like Kosa starting out as a backup I think maybe by the start of 25-26 season even him and Cuso could split a little bit with the starts and just get Kosa some good experience with the NHL but really still you know have Cuso do most of those starts so I do like that there and I think if that's your 25 lineup, that looks pretty good to me. Yeah, so last question of the night, boys. I know that this has been a long episode, so let's end it here with one last question, and this is a pretty tough one, but I hope you guys are ready for it. Where do you see the Red Wings in four years? I know that we've had four years of Eisenman so far, so where do you see the team in four years? And I guess you can kind of say that in whether whether that's in points and the standings or playoffs, however you want to announce it. So. I want to hear from you guys. Let's start with Leslie first on that. What do you hope to see from the Red Wings in four years from now? I see the Red Wings in four years at the end of June on Woodward on their Stanley Cup parade. Let's go. Let's speak it into existence. It's probably not going to happen, but I'd love to see it. Uh, No, but in all honesty... um, so in four years, that'd be twenty-seven, like the twenty-seven, the twenty-six, twenty-seven season. Uh, I see them. I see them comfortably in the playoff spot. I, I'm thinking about this, keeping in mind that teams like 
uh, Tampa, Toronto, Boston, they're not going to stick around forever. I mean, I think we've been talking about on this podcast that Boston has realistically this year, maybe next year to go for it. Um, so I think after four years, you're going to see pretty much like the Atlantic division get like flipped around. So we'll have like Buffalo, Ottawa, the Red Wings, maybe not Montreal, but that should be the top three. I could see them in the top three. I'm going to say they're third in the Atlantic in four years. And they're comfortably in a playoff spot. And they're just humming along. And it's it's not like they're not contending for a cup yet, but they're just entering that, that cup window of contention. Derek? Everyone talks about that eight-year period with Stevie right now. After eight years with Tampa, they won the Stanley Cup. We're at the middle part right now with them at the four-year mark, about that four-year part. So might as well say in four more years from now, why not? Let's go with what Leslie said. We're going to have a parade. Stanley Cup for days, baby. But keep in mind that when he went and started, I'm going to be left blanket here for a little bit. I do like what Derek said. But keep in mind that when he started his tenure in uh, Tampa, he had – same coast in Le Cavalier. So he definitely had a lot more to inherit. He really only had Larkin here in Detroit, but I like where it's at, Derek. I mean you gotta think positive in those ones. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to prove you wrong, but he, he definitely had a little bit more help in Tampa. Yeah, it's very true. Maybe our ten-year prospect on Stevie with this one, but at the same time, with the prospects we have coming up, with what we have, what we can trade for, what we can attain. I say after three years, we're going to have a playoff contending team. At four years, we have someone maybe possibility that we can actually make a run for the cup. Like, I'm not going to say it's far-fetched, but at the same time, I know it's a hard, attainable thing. But if the Red Wings pull it all together in that period of time and they can join to get all their stuff going, their offense, their defense, their power play, their power kill, mainly their power play right now for me, Jesus Christ, can we do something a little more? But... That comes with time. We got new coaches, new head coach. Derek's doing great. I don't love him just because he spells his name the right way, like I do. But we got to see what they do in these couple of years. We have to like learn. We got to lean on them. We got to like give them the anticipation that they need to actually build themselves up. We'll see what happens. But I think something good's gonna come out at four year mark for sure, especially with these up and comers. Going to myself now. Um... I, 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 I do see a lot of progression in four years. I really do. Um, a play, a, a playoff team, yes. Um, I think that we're gonna be. I, I do think that our division, the Atlantic division, is probably going to be one of the tougher divisions. Still, I think that that's when you're going to start seeing a real huge decline in teams like Tampa, Toronto, um. Boston even, you know, and then like you guys mentioned, you know, there's teams like Buffalo and Ottawa that Steve Eisenman has alluded that they're technically ahead of us, but that's also because what have they done in the years that we weren't doing what they were doing, you know, so they've had more opportunities to draft at higher positions, um, you know, and that's unfortunately for the Red Wings where we haven't had the opportunity to do that. Now, is that Eisenman's fault? No, it's not. Is that the prospect's fault that we drafted? No. I guess if you wanted to put the blame on something, put it on the lottery system for us going from <laughs> potentially having the number one overall pick to the fourth, you know? So, but I, I digress on that topic, but um, yeah, I think the Red Wings, you know, by 2027, you know, you're looking at them as either in the third or the second spot in the Atlantic division. And at worst case, you know, they're a wild card spot team, you know, and, you know, you have a whole entire metropolitan division that you got to fight through as well. So it's going to be tough. They have a lot of good teams over there. Um, a lot of things have to go right. And like you guys said, you know, the coaching staff has to continue to be good. And Derek Lalonde, they need to fix the power play. The penalty kill has been decent, but that also needs to improve. Um, and it really just comes down to all these players. Cider has to continue being great. Raymond needs to pick it up a little bit, not saying that he's been doing anything wrong, but that's someone that we really want to see potentially being a 70-point guy consistently. Uh, Marco Casper, we want to see him thrive right away if we can. 
And I think the general core right now of Larkin, Raymond, Sider, Wallman, and that's who it is right now. Valeno, Rasmussen, toss those guys in there as well. You know, uh, Bergeron, even. This is someone that could be with the team long term as well. You know, this is a good surrounding group to be around. You know, they're they're young, younger ish. You know, we have one of the younger teams in the league right now, and it's just going to continue trending that way. And you know, just by adding free agents, and if you can make those really great trades, like I keep on mentioning, you know, um, it's only going to help those kinds of players a lot more. And that's something that we can make for the Larkin argument that if Larkin was surrounded by the, t- like if we had, if we were to draft Larkin this season and insert him in the team, Larkin's overall point production throughout his whole entire tenure as a Red Wing would be a lot better, probably 10 to 15 to 20 points better in each season. So that that's a lot to speak on. And, you know, that's why I feel bad for Larkin and everyone says that he can be a two C on a cup contending team. Okay. If he can be a two C for us, that's, that's great. We would love to have a one C, but Larkin is a 1C for us, and there's nothing wrong with that because he's just as good, and he has the defensive responsibilities to be that 1C. And that's why you don't see him getting... Okay, McDavid's not a good example because he's just a freak of nature, but you guys kind of get where I'm going at. If he sacrificed a little bit more of his defense to be an offensive producer, he can. He was drafted to be an offensive guy. So don't worry so much about what the Red Wings are doing right now, but try to be excited about what's to come for this team. They have a lot of good things happening for them. They have a lot of great prospects and we're just going to keep adding it. We have four first round picks in the next two years. That's four players in two years that we will be adding, whether if that's you want to draft them or if you want to pack them up for players from other teams that see them as trash and will value them as treasure. So that's all we have for you guys tonight. We really do appreciate you guys sticking around. Um, before I do let you all go, final thoughts from the boys. Leslie? I really like eating pizza, and I think pineapple belongs on pizza. Yum, yum. Derek, final words, final thoughts. Leslie, you lost me so quick on that last statement. You didn't no say what I pineapple on pizza. No. No pineapple on pizza. You stop that right now. That'll be an Bloody episode for the off season. I don't know what to take from this. Picture. I don't know what to take the, from this, but I'm gonna assume that that's Derek's final words. My final thoughts are: yeah. you both make me cringe so hard and go Red Wings. Um, hopefully, they result in go. a dub tonight. If not, it'll be a long losing streak. And uh, let's go for Bedard. Hopefully, we can get him soon. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit the notification bell so that you know when the next episodes come up. Smash the like button. And as always, don't be afraid to leave a comment. Let us know what you think. Give us some uh, questions. Let us know what you guys think about the podcast, you know. Give us some details that you would want us to know. What Derek said, if you guys heard him. I don't know what he said, but thanks again, everyone. We hope to see you again soon. (laughs) Go Red Wings. Thanks again, everyone.